In today's video, we are talking about radiation and we're talking about it in the form of EBRT. We're gonna be looking at abstract 388 from ASCO GU 2025 and that will be linked in the comment section below this video. Now we're gonna be talking about cure rates. We're gonna be talking about clinical trials and the language that is used. But the point of the video is to tell you how does beam radiation versus brachytherapy and other forms of radiation compare? And we're gonna be using this abstract to talk about that data set. So today we're gonna to be talking to Dr. Mark Schulz. He's a 30 year medical oncologist who is focused solely on prostate cancer, and we're going to get his perspective. So in today's video, we're gonna talk about different types of radiation, but before we do, I just wanted to give some context to some certain terms that we see in prostate cancer clinical trials, and I think it's important for patients to recognize when we hear these terms, um, you know, different clinical trials are looking at different qualitative outcomes. So there's overall survival, so how long did someone live? There's PSA progression, so if you had a treatment, how long does it take for your PSA to progress? And really what we all want, and you know, the most important thing that we talk about, and this is where overall survival comes in, is cure rates. And it's kind of interesting because we compare radiations oftentimes, and oh yeah, you know, it's effective, and a lot of people compare it against surgery. You're looking at cure rates, so the idea of being cured, but another thing that we have to look at is what they call QOL, quality of life. And so all of these factors really need to come into play when you're making a decision about a treatment. And so in today's clinical trial, it's from ASCO GU 2025, it's Abstract 388, and it's talking about EBRT, so a type of radiation, and they're comparing it to hormone therapy. So before we get on to our bigger conversation of comparing uh, radiation therapies, let's talk about this abstract for a minute. So can you talk about kind of the outcomes and what they were looking at and really what the goal was of the clinical trial? So it came from Kaiser. I think it's a West Coast HMO that uh, does a large volume. And a guy named Barry Goy, uh, who's been a radiation therapist, a very respected one at Kaiser for some time, went through, sifted through their information and looked at hundreds and hundreds of patients that had had uh, beam radiation at Kaiser with or without six months of hormone therapy for what we call intermediate risk prostate cancer. So the type of prostate cancer that does need treatment, but not the worst type. What was useful about this report is that it gave like 10 and greater year outcomes. We know the prostate cancer story plays out slowly and to really define how well people do, you need a lot of time to see whether they stay cured or not. The thing that's confusing in the cancer world is that with prostate cancer, if it's treated properly, the mortality rates are very low. If it's not treated optimally, if you don't get cured, it can be a real headache to have the, the cancer come back again and then to try and treat a situation that the prostate's already been treated, it's more fragile now, it's more difficult to treat. You may have to go on hormone therapy. There are a lot of very negative things that happen, not in the sense of someone dying of the disease, but the impact of the cancer coming back and uh, degrading a person's quality of life, the QOL that you talked about. The not too surprising fact from this report was that after 10 years, about half of the men had had their cancer relapse, even though they were treated with state-of-the-art beam radiation with or without six months of ancillary hormone therapy. Hormone therapy is thought to enhance cure rates and improve the anti-cancer effect of the radiation. These patients were treated with appropriate state-of-the-art therapy. Only half stayed cured. Pretty disappointing. Not that surprising to myself, who's looked at other studies of similar structure and that also report much higher relapse rates than you would typically be comfortable. Well, then one would hope if you go through this exotic radiation and hormone treatment that looking at uh, cure rates, hopefully in the 80 to 90 plus percent range, and to have only 50 percent of the men uh, stay cured is disappointing. I think that this has led us uh, at the PCRI many times to talk about looking toward a higher type of higher dose type of radiation such as brachytherapy as a more definitive treatment and leading to higher durable cure rates than what we're getting with beam radiation. So getting into the why of why these men failed, you know, I know you're talking about brachytherapy and the higher dosage. Is it that the, you know, EBRT or the IMRT or any of these types of beam radiations are lower dose and they're not being as impactful at killing the cancer or is it that they're missing cancer? No, they're not missing cancer. The reality is, is that when you beam radiation through normal tissue from outside into the prostate and where the beams cross, that's where they get the really high dose. But there is a limit, a safe limit. And there have been studies, you know, pushing that limit higher and higher to see what the human body can tolerate. And so, when they arrive at that limit, it's capped at that level. Otherwise, you're going to run into unacceptable toxicity. The reality is, is that 
Due to the limitations of the technology and the physics of the situation, when the radiation has to be beamed through normal tissue, the doctors that are giving beam radiation can't safely deliver the same intensity of radiation that a brachytherapist can, as someone who puts seed radiation right in the prostate. They don't have to let the radiation pass through normal tissue to hit the target. And yes, it's basically an inadequate dose of radiation. Why would this be accepted? And, and the answer is, well, it's been sort of the pro forma for a long time. The difficulties with the cancer coming back uh, have been sort of a reality in the prostate cancer world with both surgery and radiation for many years. The, quote, relapse may not occur for many years down in the future. And there's just a lot of momentum for treating people in this fashion. It became accepted as a standard approach. Outside the United States, it's different. Usage of brachytherapy is continually rising for the obvious reasons that statistical outcomes are better. Here in the United States, it's sort of business as usual. Suboptimal dose is the problem. Before I get to my next question, I just wanted to remind you that this September we're having an in-person prostate cancer patients and caregivers conference, and it's a great way to get your questions answered by world-renowned experts. You can learn more at pcri.org forward slash conference. Now, don't forget to click that subscribe button and share these videos with other people. It's a great way to support the work we do, and if you would like to support us financially, you can do so at pcri.org forward slash donate. Now back to my conversation with Dr. Schultz. Well, it's kind of interesting because in the study, they're talking about patients who were treated with or without six months of hormone therapy. Now, the interesting thing about it is so hormone therapy is a systemic uh, treatment where it goes through your blood and it's supposed to be cleaning out, you know, micro metastasis that could pop up in the body. So you're getting the direct dosage of the radiation to the prostate, into the prostate bed and surrounding areas, lymph nodes, but then you're also getting the systemic effect. The fact that these men also progressed even with the hormone therapy is quite interesting. Why do you think that was? More and more we're finding as men are being staged more accurately, that very few of these men have micrometastatic disease. So the hormone therapy really isn't eradicating micrometastasis and thus enhancing cure rates. What it does do is synergize with the suboptimal dose of radiation inside the prostate and working together with the radiation, you, you augment the cure rate or the eradication of the cancer in the prostate gland itself. This is sometimes talked about as a reason to do surgery. Well, at least you don't have to do hormone therapy to get local control to eradicate the tumor itself. I don't know, people aren't aware of the fact that w there is no such thing as a radio-resistant tumor. If you give a big enough dose of radiation, you can kill any prostate cancer but due to the limitations of beam radiation, and when men are getting these forms of beam radiation, they are getting suboptimal radiation uh, in many cases, not all cases, some men do get cured, about half in the study that you're reporting from. But the cure rates are you know, twice as good in, the, in men that get an adequate dose of radiation through brachytherapy. So when we talk about quality of life, if you think about radiation side effects, you, know, you have short-term side effects and long-term side effects. And you know, I think when it also comes to hormone therapy, you know, we see a lot of doctors just put patients on hormone therapy automatically, even when they are getting localized, you know, treatment to the prostate. And so in comparison with brachytherapy, are we talking about brachytherapy as a mono alone uh, treatment? Do, do you have to go on hormone therapy as well with this? I think that's one of the incredibly attractive things about brachytherapy is that you don't have to use ancillary hormone therapy to get the uh, adequate cure rates that you're looking for. I think a number of attractive things, uh, including the fact that you're not getting sprayed with low-dose radiation because all the radiation stays right in the gland when you do brachytherapy. You're getting a big enough dose, so you're getting durable cure rates, and then you don't have to add hormone treatment to the brachytherapy to get those results. There's a whole constellation of attractive reasons to be doing brachytherapy for cure rather than uh, beam radiation such as IMRT, SBRT, Proton therapy, CyberKnife, these are all different brands of beam radiation. One of my favorite pieces of data as I was learning about prostate cancer and specifically brachytherapy over the years was done by John Blasco and Peter Grimm up in Seattle. And they did a great comparison of IMRT versus brachytherapy versus surgery. Can you speak to that data? The website was compiled by a guy named Peter Grimm. He's since passed on, but was one of the fathers of brachytherapy here in the United States. Dr. Grimm compiled all meaningful studies of surgery, beam radiation and seed radiation, and looked at their five-year cure rates. For him to include those studies in his presentation, and there's a website that shows these things graphically, there had to be a, a certain number of patients in the study, you know, two or 300 patients minimum or 100 patients. There had to be professional uh, standards in the methodology that was used. But there, I think, 
well over 100 studies, maybe several hundred studies, and he looked at the average five-year cure rates with each of these different modalities, showing that surgery and beam radiation had about the same cure rates. This is for intermediate risk or high-risk patients, and that brachytherapy consistently showed higher cure rates. This has been demonstrated now in randomized prospective trials as well. That was what originally caught our attention, was Dr. Grimm's compilation of all these different studies and averaging out the cure rates, showing uh, consistently better outcomes with brachytherapy. In regards to cure rates, when it comes to brachytherapy, it sounds like we definitely have, you know, a great treatment that's worked and it shows that over five years they can have sustainable cures. But with IMRT and 50% of those patients, or EBRT in the study, it did work. So where is beam radiation really effective? And how do you kind of counteract, okay, well, brachytherapy is not widely available as much, IMRT and all these beam radiations are, and where can they be used that would be really beneficial to patients if it's not delivering as high of a dose? Right. Well, I tend to think of beam radiation in, if you talk about the newly diagnosed category where people are trying to get cured, for maybe an elderly guy who doesn't want to go through a procedure, and uh, this is, you know, an invisible beam, you don't typically feel anything. There are a number of very sophisticated centers that can deliver the treatment. And Dr. Goy's article shows that the mortality rates are minimal. So in a 75, 80-year-old man, if it can keep the disease in check for another 10 years, that's awesome. And uh, it's non-invasive. So I don't think that it's uh, unreasonable to use it in, as men get a little bit older. My primary usage of beam radiation would be for men that have anything outside the prostate, for lymph nodes, uh, if they have any metastatic sites, SBRT to bone lesions or lymph nodes is, I think, a big breakthrough now that we have PSMA PET scans. There's also a lot of evidence that uh, the combination, if the brachytherapist maybe isn't that skilled, that they can give, say, two-thirds of a dose of radiation to the prostate with brachytherapy with seeds, and then give one-third of the dose with beam radiation sprayed over the top of the seeds. And that you know, consolidates the radiation there. And it allows for a big dose of radiation, but not with the dangers that are associated with trying to deliver all that dose through beam. And so combinations of seed plus beam over the top are, are very popular and very effective. People shouldn't forget that in um, men undergoing immune therapy, there's some suggestion that radiating a metastatic site, uh, the so-called abscopal effect, can enhance an immune reaction against prostate cancer as well. So we're very grateful that this resource exists, uh, but the um, somewhat disappointing long-term cure rates that are being reported by Dr. Goy in this particular article and have been reported in other articles as well uh, suggest that maybe it shouldn't be the primary approach for younger men who really want to get cured the first time and not have to deal with a recurrence later. We have some great long-form educational videos from our conferences from radiation experts, where they talk about the data sets of how the radiation works, the clinical trials, they talk about the side effects, and they talk about the overall outcomes. And I'm gonna go ahead and link those in the comment section below this video, things like brachytherapy, IMRT, and the like. Because what you wanna do is watch these videos, and when you talk to your doctor about your options, you wanna talk about side effect management and expectation management when you are looking at and pursuing a cure rate. So, you know, since radiation has short-term side effects and long-term side effects, you want to be aware of those from the get-go so that you can learn how to manage them properly. And you also want to learn what your PSA should be acting like over time. So we're going to go ahead and, you know, link those videos in the comment section. Dr. Schulz has also done a couple of them. And it's a great way to take the information with you to the doctor, write down your notes ahead of time and your questions ahead of time. And this can help you choose which really is the best option for you. Quality of life matters so much, and I think in the pursuit of a cure, a lot of patients overlook it. And unfortunately, 18 to 24 months later, they may not know there are long-term side effects from radiation that didn't happen at the get-go. And because they weren't told ahead of time, they don't know where it's coming from or how to manage it. So again, we just wanna make sure you're fully informed as you're making this decision so that you can know these are my options, this is what to expect, this is how my PSA is going to act, and these are the short-term and long-term side effects, and here is my game plan on how to manage them. Now, if you need help with your particular case, you can talk to our helpline at pcri.org forward slash helpline. These are prostate cancer patients who have been through a lot of the treatments that we talk about, but they're just a great resource in order to get your questions ready, to talk to you about the various uh, you know, treatments you may be looking at, and give you information so that you can go to your doctor, you can go to your medical team and say, okay, well, these are my questions, 
this is the information I've gained, how do I put this into context for my particular case? If you have further questions, please leave them in the comment section below our video. It's a great way for us to curate more videos in the future and answer your questions. We really appreciate that you trust us, that you watch this video, and please remember, most of all, you're not alone. I hope you have a great week.